our old church hymnals out. Everybody will stand up and we'll. The song's been on my heart and mind for a couple of days, so let's all stand. We'll open up just some corporate singing. Let's go page 120, I think. Victory in Jesus. Amen. Who, who's my loud singer this morning? Who wants to leave Michelle? I, she's going to have to repent for lying now. Who, who wants to lead us this morning? Papa or Joe? You guys are usually the big voices. Papa, you want to lead us on victory in Jesus? You got the voice this morning? Joe, I'll let you go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, in way of announcements, uh, we have, I guess the next thing would be July 5th. John Hanson will be here July 5th at 11 a.m. So, and also, we're not going to do Sunday school July 5th. So, July 5th, mark that, it's going to be uh, church only at 11. And John Hanson will be here July 5th. So, write that down, come out if you can. I always enjoy hearing him. He is uh, over IMO, which is Twizz Church support on a monthly basis, and then also um, what we've been taking up offerings for for the shoe boxes. We do approximately, I think, what was it, 250 last year, something like that, 250 shoe boxes to the children in Haiti, and then we also sponsor different children <clears throat> so that they're able to go to school and get an education and get a daily meal. So he's over that. He comes in every so often. So if you want it at that time, so maybe so an extra to his ministry. I want to encourage you to keep that date in mind. If you want to, if God puts it on your heart, however, if you want to sow extra into that ministry, you'll have that opportunity to do so July 5th. Amen? And it is a great ministry. And then July 3rd, I guess that's before the 5th, isn't it? Maybe I should announce that first. But July 3rd on Friday night at approximately 6 p.m., this is for everybody, we're going to have some food, and some different games, and then later that night we're going to have some fireworks here, probably about around 10 p.m. And then the collective uh, is going to minister in song. I think they're going to do it down there. We're going to have like a little fire and just kind of have an acoustic set with the collective. We'll be doing that that night as well. And it's not all night. It'll probably go midnight, 2 a.m., somewhere around then. But keep that in mind, July 3rd. So if you can, we really want you to. There'll be plenty of food free to eat. Come out and have a good time. And then keep in mind, July 4th, of course. I guess it's Louisa doing fireworks Saturday, July 4th. Does anybody know for sure? Anybody heard? Probably. So you go watch fireworks, Louisa, July 4th, and then come out here July 5th that morning and hallelujah, get to listen to John Hanson. Such a blessing he is. So it's, that's a busy weekend. And then. We have Awaken, July 24th and 25th. And speaking of Awaken, we're going to start this morning taking up offerings. Anybody wants to sow specifically to that ministry? Um, over the next few Sundays, we're going to give you the opportunity to personally sow into that ministry. What Awaken is, which she actually had a shirt on this morning, Awaken. It's a free concert available to everybody. It's held in this year, Paintsville High School, right? Johnson Central High School. Uh, it's Friday night and Saturday night. Uh, you'll probably be getting us a schedule. A flyer put on the back. Michelle's going to get a flyer we put back there so you can see. And then hopefully I'll get to attend it this year. <laughs> Lord willing. But uh, we, as a church, we sold that ministry. It's free. It's, it's geared mainly toward the youth in the area, but the adults have a good time as well. It's all the popular music you hear on the K-Love. They bring in those types of artists to come in and minister, and, and it's a good time. I've not been able to go the past couple years, but I've, I've been in prior years and enjoy it. So we'll give you that opportunity this morning to sow into that. And so while we're out along those lines, we'll go ahead and take up our tithes and offerings this morning. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and the message says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will, gener will reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Amen. Hallelujah. If we've got our tithes and offerings, go ahead. And if you want to sow and awaken, if you're writing a check, go ahead and make it out to Bethel. Or if you got cash, just get you an envelope. And right on the front, awaken him, and then it'll get, even though you're right to check the Bethel, we'll separate it. And way when we have all of it together, we can just give them one donation. Amen? Anything else I may have forgot? Sonny, I guess you want to get a song up while we take up, can you? Or even if you want to sing, whatever you want to do. <clears throat> you can play one or sing one, whatever you want to do. 
Amy and Jesse are on some R&R, &R, rest and relaxation. That sounds pretty good. I may have to do that here in a month or two. <laughs> Gavin and Willie, you guys want to take up our offering this morning? I like putting Willie to work. He looks too comfortable back here. Glory to God. Everybody say this with me if you believe it. I thank you, Father, that you have blessed me so I can give. I give because I love you and want to be obedient to your word. I give willingly from the heart. My I give because I want to fulfill the Great Commission in this world. My desire is that the good news, the gospel of Christ, be preached to the entire world. And I give in faith, and I thank you, Father, for the return of my financial seed that is sown in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. So be it. Glory to God. Amen. Huh? Okay. you take this cup from me. Fear has stolen all my sleep. If tomorrow means my death, pray you'll save the souls within. Let the songs I sing bring joy to you, and the words I say profess my love, and the notes I choose be your favorite too, Father let my heart be after you, in this hour of doubt I see. Who I am is not just me. Give me strength to die myself. Love can live to tell 
Step in deeper areas of worship and new levers. Come out in couple places and you'll see bigger growth. Areas are a larger vision of God and things is breaking loose in the spirit. It's been held back. It's turning. Come and spread change. Areas need purge. And worship needs growth. Start sowing and you'll see a change. Areas you're not seeing. Expect God to change things suddenly from glory to glory. Come out and be separate. Come ready to worship. You want and desire moving in the spirit. Come ready and see change. Change of heart. Time is closest to the end of the end, so don't lose heart or give up. Rise out of your comfort and step up, and you'll see changes. Repent. Now is time to get in order. And God is moving, and God is speaking. Don't miss your visitation of God. Arise and step in deeper water, out of the low places. It's your choice. Be wise and not foolish. And this is what God allowed. What you allowed, be ready. God's Spirit will move mildly anointing. Come humble heart. Time is now faith. And doors open will be restored this broken in heart. And this is God's will. Agree with God and see as God see. And this is time. Anybody got a taste for everything they want to share this morning? Yeah. 
Arise in the spirit. We're not children of the night, but children of the day. See, some people don't understand that, but how could you? See, both were similar in meaning, but though different views. So, the message in tongues can be lengthier than the actual interpretation, but you see, oftentimes you don't get the exact. What she said verbatim, but you get is called interpretation. You see, and it's you can have interpretation from different views, but the same meaning. And that's why it, it's not nothing confusing. But you see, the Bible talks about First Corinthians 12 talks about different kinds of tongues and then interpretation tongues. You see, in a church service, for someone to begin speaking in tongues with no interpretation would be wrong. But you see, when the one does so under the action of the Spirit. The interpretation of given it allows edification to the church. You see, it is a time for us as a church to arise and once again begin walking as sons and daughters of God, not defeated but in victory, because He has won the victory. Jesus Christ has set us free, and He has won the victory. So, hallelujah! Let's enjoy the benefits that he has given us and not be afraid because those who are in fear are in torment but we are not in torment but we are in freedom freedom to do what he tells us to do and to live our lives according to the plan and purpose which he has given us glory to God Amen well Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48 Matthew 5, 48. <clears throat> Tells us, You therefore must be perfect. And we'll stop there oftentimes and we'll say, Oh my, oh me. God wants me to be perfect. And you'll say to yourself, That is untainable. How is it that I can be perfect? But if we look here in the Amplified, Matthew 5.48, it says, You therefore must be perfect, growing into complete maturity of godliness in mind and character, having reached the proper height of virtue and integrity, as your Heavenly Father is perfect. What Jesus is talking about here is a growing process. You see, we are not perfect in ourselves. We're going to make mistakes and we're going to have shortcomings in our lives. But yet, God expects us to grow into a mature man and woman unto God. See, just this, Debbie talks about, she gave us a message there in the Holy Spirit talking about her rising up, taking her place, and, and, and coming back to the heart of God. 
We are to arise and take our place in the body of Christ and become mature men and women in that body. You see, a child will make mistakes. Anybody got children in here? Got Father's Day coming up. I'm a father. And my child, I love them dearly, both of them. You know, more than what words can express. And how that it's such a joy to watch them grow. But you know, as they grow, they mess up. They do silly things. God doesn't require or expect anything different from us. As the Lord says, as babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, that we may grow there to grow up. You see, there's a growing process. And the children, we don't expect them to be perfect in everything that they do. No, as they grow up, we give them responsibilities and we delegate certain things to them. And we let them do it. Even though they may not do it the exact way we would have done it, but you got to let them kind of spread their own wings and fly so that they can learn. And God gives us His Word and He tells us in our heart things to do and then He expects us to do it. But sometimes we place so much pressure on ourselves in thinking that we have to do it perfectly. And that if I don't do it perfectly, then I have failed God. That's not what Jesus is saying. We see this also in Ephesians chapter 4. In verse 11, And he himself gave some to be apostles, and some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and knowledge of the Son of God, to what? It says, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In verse 14, it goes along right along with that. That what? that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning crafts of deceitful plotting that speaking the truth in love may grow up, everybody say grow up, in all things to him which is the head of Christ. So it is through Christ that we are perfect. And it's through the maturity of our spiritual walk growing up in him in Christ's teaching that in the eyes of God, we are perfect. You see, because God has a plan and purpose for us, and just as Christ was perfect in the eyes of God, when we operate as the body of Christ, we are operating under the same ministry of Jesus Christ. I like what the Amplified says here in Ephesians 4.13. It says, That it might develop until we all obtain oneness in the faith and the comprehension of the full and accurate knowledge of the Son of God, that we might arrive at really mature manhood, the completeness of personality, which is nothing less than the standard height of Christ on perfection. The measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ and the completeness, completeness found in Him. You see, when you're born again, when you become a Christian, you begin a life, a journey of continually growing in right behavior. It's a daily walk, isn't it? Yes, just as your children grow up. Our spiritual development is accomplished day after day. It's a life of living as Christ. And I know I, throughout my life, I've had a lot of growing to do and continue to have a lot of growing to do. You know, nobody, nobody is perfect in their own self. But you see, it's through Jesus Christ we are in the eyes of God. We need to understand that living our life pleasing unto God does not mean that we won't make mistakes. God doesn't expect perfect vessels but willing vessels. And I'm thank, thankful that God showed me this in, in early in my ministry. That He said, you know, this speaks to my heart. Of course, it was not audibly, but just thinking on things and meditating and praying. He says, Brad, I expect you to be faithful and I expect you to be willing. I don't expect you to be perfect, to do everything exactly the way it should be done. Because you know what? We're human. And as long as we're in this body, in the flesh, in this world, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to miss it. You know, I see a Bible full of men and women who made mistakes in the eyes of God. Who missed it? But you know what? God still used them in spite of their imperfections, didn't He? Man, we got, you know, Hebrews, uh, the, the Hebrews 11, the great chapter of faith, talking about how that. You know, men were able to overcome kingdoms and subdue so many things because of the faith they placed in God in spite of their own mistakes. And you can go look through it. Every one of them. Oh, well, 
The only one we find that really was that we don't see make a audible mistake was Joseph in his life. You can't really find anywhere in the Bible where he made a really bad mistake. But uh, so many others had faults and failures in their life. Moses. Moses killed somebody. Moses was a stutterer. Moses was fearful. Hallelujah. God used Moses. Abraham. He tried to work out God's plan and purpose in his own self through his uh, servant. It caught, you know, it caused some harm, but hallelujah, that, that wasn't God's perfect will and plan for him. But yet God still gave him Isaac. Hallelujah. So, God will use you too. You see, we got to be willing to step up in faith in God's Word. And when we make mistakes, understand that God corrects us because He loves us. And then learn from our mistakes. That's a big thing. You know, it's, it's one thing to make a mistake, and it's another thing to continue to make the same mistakes over and over. We've got to learn from our mistakes. Hebrews 12.4 says, Hebrews 12.4 says, In your struggle against sin. You see, Christ has set us free from sin. You know, sin no longer has dominion over us. That's according to God's Word. But yet we find ourselves daily struggling against sin. Because why is that? Because we have a body. We have a flesh. We live in this world. And sin is a temptation. But I know growing that there's things that were tempting to me as a child that the same temptation isn't there today. Why is that? Because I've grown out of those things. I can remember as a child, you know, wanting this. Well, some things change, some things don't change, but, you know, what? maybe just wanting a Ninja Turtle so bad, just wanting it, you know, I mean, every time you go to the store, you say, oh, man, I really want that. And, and just wanting that, you know, that toy. But now I walk by, you know, the toy, but I'm still even tempted by some of the toys. They look pretty cool. I'm about tempted sometimes to buy some just to put up, you know, keep them. If I kept all the Ninja Turtles I had when I was a kid in the original boxes, they'd be worth some money today. But, man, how I desire them toys. But today I walk by them and, you know, I, they're just toys. You know, even though I could go buy me, you know, several Ninja Turtles at a time. But I don't because I no longer have that same desire. Because I've grown. You know, maybe I've grown into more expensive toys. But I've grown from cheaper toys. And we'll grow in this life of things. And seeing those things that in the early, in our early stages of spiritual development, we'll look back and we'll say, man, that used to be such an obstacle for me to overcome. And I was challenged with that daily. But it's no longer an issue. Why? Because you grew up. You became mature in God. And then some people altogether never grew up. Some people are sitting in the pew still sucking on an old bottle. <laughs> when those that should be caring for the children than themselves are still having to be cared for. And it's really sad that, you know, let's just be real and be honest. And there's a lot of churches that have a lot of people in them that are still babes when it comes to the things of God. It should be taking care of others. And, you know, when we do have new converts to come in, well, they require care just as a child requires care, don't they? If you got a baby, which Courtney getting ready to have one tomorrow. Well, what happened if Courtney just, you know, talked to it some, fed it one time, and then said, well, you're on your own. What would happen to that baby? It would die, wouldn't it? Well, spiritually, baby Christians need the same kind of care. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to need to be fed. They're going to be need to look at. They're going to be need to talk to and care for. Hallelujah. And that's up to us to take care of the baby Christians. <coughs> But in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father rests his son? It says, My son, <clears throat> do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as a son. Does God ever correct you? He does me. Why does he do that? Because I am a son, hallelujah. It's 
should be an encouraging thing to know that you're being corrected. Because God loves you and those He loves, He disciplines. God loves you and He will correct you. It's not pleasant at the time, but it's for your benefit. And it's part of the growing process. See, Proverbs 13.24 says, He who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him dis dis disciplines him promptly. And it's oftentimes wrong. Have anybody ever heard he who who he spares his he who spares his rod spoils his son or spoils his child? Everybody hear that? A lot of people quote that way, but it doesn't say who he, who he spares his discipline his child. Or, it doesn't say spoils his child. The Bible says hates his child. Think about that. And hate is a strong word. It's not pleasant discipline our children, and it's discipline doesn't always mean you got spanking. There's different way. I know my girls taking the iPhone or iPad is a lot more severe than, than spanking them. But that's discipline and correcting them. You know, however your child receives the best discipline, it's talking about discipline your child so that they understand correction. There is consequences to disobedience. There is consequences to disobeying God. I wish my children always did exactly like I told them to do, but as children will do, they'll what? Disobey. And disobedience, there is punishment that comes with that disobedience. And I love them, and I want them to be contributing members of society so when they mess up, there's consequences for mistakes. Our Father wants us to be diligent and to be mature men and women in Christ so He disciplined us, so he disciplined us so that we can grow. But once disciplined, we need to learn from it and don't continue in the same mistakes. Proverbs 9 8 tells us, Do not correct a scoffer, lest he hates you. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will still be wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. You see, there are some people that's just so hard headed, you'll correct them, and they'll get mad because you're correcting them. But the Bible tells us that a wise person, when you correct him, he'll thank you. Why? Because he wants to grow in wisdom, he wants to flourish. He understands that fearing God, which fearing God does not mean that you're afraid of him like you'd be afraid of like a tornado or a wasp. But no, you have a reverent and holy respect for him and what he does. So I know to myself, I want to walk according to his will, to his commandments. So for somebody to correct me, saying, Brett, you're missing it, I receive it joyfully. It, it may not always be at the time joyful, but I'm thankful for that correction. Why? Because I fear God and I want to walk according to His commandments. I want to be in His plan and purpose for my life. But there are just some people that you correct them, even though they'll be godly, they'll get so bad they'll even leave the church sometimes. There's a way about doing it. But, you know, some people just don't take God's correction. Even though you're trying to help, it's for their own benefit, but they'll become mad. But stay tender. You know, we're never too old to be corrected. Does anybody here know everything and do everything right? Now, whether you're 5 or 55, you still make mistakes, don't you? You do. But you see, those mistakes help us in learning. It's a growing process, you know. If you do it one way wrong, and then you learn the right way, well, you better believe, at least I do, you know, I don't do it that way again. Do it wrong. If I build something, I always try to find the most efficient way to do it. And when I find the most efficient way, why well, keep on doing it that way? But sometimes I'll make mistakes, oftentimes. But don't be discouraged, be encouraged. The Lord loves you, and the Lord is going to discipline you because He loves you. But sin always leads to death. And continuing sin will cost you in this life. Sin is disobedience. James 1.12 tells us, 
Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and types. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. You see, you may not die spiritually, but the Word tells us that sin leads to death. Sin can kill you early in this life or cause problems in your life or your family's life. Sin is also disobedience. Disobedience is sin. Romans 5, 19 tells us, For just through the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners. So also through the obedience of one man, the many will be made righteous. You see, Adam and Eve were disobedient to God's commandments, and therefore they sinned. When you're disobedient to God's plan and purpose for your life, you know you're living in sin, and you can't walk in God's best for your life because God does not bless sin. There are many men and women of God who have right motives, and things may look good and natural, but you know they're not doing what God's called them to do, and because of that disobedience, they die early, or there's problems in their life. It's not God. It's not God that's putting these things on them. But you see, if you get out of God's plan and purpose, if you get out of His will, then you're on Satan's territory. You're out of God's cover. Well, evaluate your life. Is prayer working for you or not? Are you seeing results? And we know that we walk by faith. The just live by faith. What I'm saying is, is there's disobedience in a lot of people's life. They're being hard hearted against God. They won't do what He tells them to do. And they're suffering the consequences in their body because of their disobedience. I'm not saying that's every case, but that's, that's sometimes. Many ministers preach many years, been about the Father's business, but they didn't do exactly, they didn't do what God wanted to do. They did their own plan and purpose, and they died early. And then people oftentimes wonder, well, and God must no, God must no longer be in the healing business because so and so brother saw so I know man man he preached every Sunday and Wednesday he was a pastor but he died early and he was doing we'll say well he was in God's will how do you know he was in God's will you don't know what's going on, on the inside sin leads to death do I believe brother so and so went to heaven absolutely. But you see, he wasn't being obedient to God. And because he was not being obedient to God, it cost them their life here. The word's true, amen? That God be true in every work, in, in every man or, or thing that's contrary to God's word of life. But it says, 15, Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. Disobedience is sin. I've known, I've heard stories of people who receive healing, have been in disobedience. They get that correction right and instantly in their body it comes. That's not always the case. But I'm talking about maturity. You see, God expects those who've been in the ministry, those who've been saved and has time to develop. You know, He expects more out of us than He does a baby Christian. You know, Joe's got grown, grown kids. He expects more out of them than I would expect out of my daughters. Why is that? Because they're grown and able to do more. They're able to. But just because they're able doesn't mean necessarily that they will. And God requires more out of you. There's a time when He requires you to stand on your own two feet in faith. There's a time when, hallelujah, when sister and brother so-and-so's faith will work for you. But then there comes a time when you have to stand on your own faith and your own two feet. And there comes a time, so to speak, when God says, hey, you're being disobedient. You're in sin. And just as we see with the prodigal son, how that the father known that it wasn't good for his son to go out to the world. But he led him, didn't he? And because the son was out in disobedience, he suffered loss. And then he came to himself and says, well, my servants are even better than I am. He said, well, I'll just go and maybe my father will just make me a servant. But no, when he came back, what did the father do? 
Restore unto him all that was his. Not rightfully, not because the son's what what the son had did, no, because of what the father had, he wanted his son to enjoy. But the son the son didn't enjoy the things of the father until what? He came back into the father's house. He was still the father's son when he was in the world as he was in the house. That didn't change. But because of the son's disobedience, if he stayed there, he would have died young and died in poverty and lack. Amen? He would have. But you see, he returned to the father's house and all was restored unto him. So if you're out of God's will for your life, run back. Say, Father, forgive me and get back. If things in your life don't seem, if something just seems to be off, evaluate your spiritual condition. Am I doing what God has called me to do? And I think oftentimes you'll find there's just an adjustment that needs to be happening in your life. Are you doing what God's called you to do? Are you doing what you think is right to do? See, there's a difference there. There's a man's way, and then there's God's way. <laughs> Even though it be good, if it's not God's will for you, it's wrong. And it's important that we find. It's very important. It can cost you. It can cost you this life. But we're made perfect before God through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. John fifteen five. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever lives in me and I in him bears much abundant fruit. However, apart from me, cut off from vital union with me, you can do nothing. Unless God builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. And it is through us, working with Jesus Christ, that we're able to accomplish what God will have us to do in this life. Able to exceed, God's able, and hallelujah, through us, He's able to exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. You see, when we get in with God's plan and purpose, we look back in our life at a ripe old age and see, man, we see that it was little us and a lot of God. God's able to do great and mighty and wonderful things through you in obedience to Him. But you see, we go about our own mind and we try to do work things out the way we think they should happen. Never looking into God the author and finisher of our faith, who was and is and is to come, who knows the plan and purpose He has for you. And His plan and purpose for you is to prosper you, hallelujah, not to harm you, and to give you a hope in the future. And if you're walking in God's plan, He promises that you will prosper and flourish in this life. In His plan, but not your plan. God will bless His plan, but He never said He'll bless your plan. You hear me? Even though it can be good, you could be doing some wonderful programs. You could be feeding the poor, helping out many. Thank God He'll bless you as much as He can because He loves you. But to walk in that fullness, you have to be obedient to His Word. You have to do what Daddy says. Amen? Amen. But not in ourselves. It's through Jesus that we're made righteous. 1 John 1, 5. This is the message which we have heard from Him and declare to you that God is light and Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all a double L sin. Hallelujah. So even disobedience. You know, if you've been disobedient, ask God to forgive you. And hallelujah, the blood of Jesus Christ will forgive you. But you can't continue in disobedience and expect God's best. You can't stay in disobedience and expect to flourish in this life. Know what? Learn from your mistakes. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all, once again, a double L unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar. And the Word is not in us. So don't be discouraged when you mess up. So once again, we're all going to make mistakes. But we're, we're made perfect in and through Jesus Christ. And it's a life that we live growing into that perfection, growing into Jesus Christ, which is our example. He set the bar. He set the example. And we should strive daily to walk as Jesus Christ walked. But knowing that we're going to make mistakes. We will make mistakes. But God doesn't cast you away 
because you mess up. But He does expect you to learn from your mistakes and try. He wants us to grow up and become mature men and women of Christ. It's through Jesus Christ and Christ alone we are accepted in God's eyes and can live a life pleasing unto Him. God doesn't expect perfect vessels, but willing ones. Everybody says with me, God does not require me to be perfect, but willing. Amen. And then hallelujah. When you make those mistakes, ask forgiveness and then learn from it. Don't continue to make the same mistakes over and over and over and over and over again. Because church, it will cost you. It will cost you in this life. It will affect you. It will affect your children. It will affect your family and those around you. Learn. Grow up. Resist. Resist, hallelujah, when those temptations come. Because it is, as we read there in Hebrews 12, in your struggle against sin. But hallelujah, the burden of our, it is not for us to bear alone. We have to confess the Word and we have to believe in faith that we have been set free. When those temptations come, realize that they're coming from Satan, not from God. Hallelujah. Rebuke Him in the name of Jesus and then flee, hallelujah, if you got to. You know, I find that Joseph, his, his, uh, the, in, the man who brought, bought him from slavery and he was put over all of his house, that his wife really wanted to have an affair with Joseph. But we find that even one time that she had had his clothes in his hand and he fled and left him. <laughs> his, his cloak. But you see, what did he do? What did Joseph do? He fled from that sin. He fled from that temptation. And sometimes you just got to get away. Sometimes you just got to do whatever needs to be done necessary and flee that temptation. But he wants you to be willing. Willing to step out in faith on God's Word and when we make mistakes, understand that God corrects us because He loves us, and then learn from our mistakes. Amen? Amen? So grow up. Lord God, we all need to grow up, don't we? From the youngest to the oldest, where you've been saved five months or 50 years, you still got to grow. I don't find nowhere that you stop growing natural, do you? You grow until what? You pass from this life into the next. Hallelujah. One day, glory to God, we shall be perfect. But you see, we're going into that perfection. And this life is a journey to that. Hallelujah. Let's all stand. Glory to God. How many say do we have in the house today? By uplifting the hand. Let you testify. Glory to God. Well, that's just, just that's everybody. Courtney's having her baby tomorrow. Thank God. She gave a gave us a handkerchief to pray over. And what we do is Acts nineteen eleven says, "Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them." You see, there's something about cloth that transmits that healing anointing, or whatever it is that you need. We find that the one with the issue of blood touched, didn't touch Jesus, but touched the hem of His garment, or actually touched His clothes. And through those clothes, that healing anointing was transmitted. And we find also, through other examples, how that there's something about cloth that transmits uh, God's healing power. She wants uh, us to pray over this to... Hallelujah, believe, you know, that all will go well uh, and as she is delivering her child. So we're going to stand in faith, and I want everybody to get in agreement with me. Hallelujah. And we'll take this to Courtney, and, and she'll have it with her tomorrow as she is. I guess she's having a C-section, isn't she? What's she doing? So uh, let's all get in agreement with me. Amen. Father, we thank you for today, and we thank you for Courtney and Matt. And Father, we thank you that your protection... Uh, it's with them. We thank you for skill with those who are operating her. And Father, we declare in faith that it is going to go well and that the baby is healthy. And thank you for comfort and pain uh, to Courtney and peace uh, to Matt as well. So we thank you, Father, that your anointing, Father, is going and flowing from us into this 
handkerchiefs and that father, as we're just there, as father, if, as just we are laying hands on her, that anointing is being transferred. We thank you that is doing so in this cloth, that you're watching over her, you're protecting her, and that she will have a speedy recovery, that the birth will go well, and that all will be well, in the name of Jesus, and amen. Amen, hallelujah. Well, glory to God. Anything else before we're dismissed? Well, hallelujah. Well, remember, once again, I want to encourage you, July 3rd, please, we'll have plenty of food. Everybody come out. Um, and July 5th, John Hanson will be here. Hey, when are they doing a 5K for uh, Awaken? That's another thing you can get involved in. July 11th is a 5K. I think Sonny and Tad mentioned they're going to do it. Uh, I haven't decided if I am or not. I may. <laughs> but July 11th, you go down to Paint. So where's that? It's going to be at the Mountain Home Place, but you have to be registered before July 4th. Michelle, can you get that too? Can you print out something on that? And uh, yeah, and also get that, put that back there. All right. Anything else? All right. Enjoy your week.